be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior. 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> A lesson from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What did it yield? What did it, why did it yield wild grapes? Oh, excuse me, what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield wild grapes, why did it yield grapes? Why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but hurry cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. St. Paul to the Philippians. I press on to the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Brothers and sisters, Join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example 
you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. I invite you to stand as we honor the gospel of our Lord Jesus. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to Jesus, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Transitions in life often show up or reveal a lot of options in life, a lot of choices. When we move from one thing that we thought we were supposed to be doing or one thing that we have finished doing to 
a, a time or a season in our lives when maybe there are other things that the Lord might have in mind and, and we might even have some of our own ideas about what we ought to do with the next season in life. One of the difficult things that can happen is that we become trapped by the choices, numbed or even stupefied by the number of choices that are before us. I remember the time in, in my life when I made the transition from wanting to do one thing to uh, opening myself up to, to listening to the Lord as to what He might have in mind, and it just so happened that it was that season in my life that, that the Lord was finally getting through to me that He wanted me to be in some form of ministry. I remember going through that time, through that period of about a year or so, bewildered by the number of options that were before me things that I thought I might be able to do and options that I thought might be in front of me. And, and little by little, as I walked and walked and prayed and prayed, I like to, to walk when I pray, by the way, it became clearer to me that the thing that the Lord wanted from me was that I should be in ordained ministry. And as time went on, as, as that year passed, as things were orchestrated, that became a reality. I made the moves that I needed to make so that I could exercise that one choice out of many to do what the Lord was asking me to do. That's kind of that's kind of where the vineyard of the Lord is. That's how I think we need to look at it, given today's scriptures. There are a ton of choices that face us. Look at our lives today. Look at all of the things that are available to us. Look at all of the options that are before us. We have to be careful that the choices we make are the choices that will land us in the center of God's vineyard so that the, the fruit that we produce is the fruit he wants us to produce. So pardon me while I look down a little bit, but there's some really neat things that I, that I want to take out of these passages of Scripture today. There's some things that we have to realize about the vineyard of the Lord. The first thing is that being a part of God's kingdom means that we are making the choice to be the kind of grape, if you will, sweet grape, that God has wanted. The reason that he planted himself in us when we said yes to him, when we invited him into our hearts. And so God is reminding us that once we enter the walls of his vineyard and place ourselves in the midst of his vineyard, he is a jealous God. He is a God who wants all of our attention, not just some of it. He is a God who wants us to look more and more like him every day of our lives, to be holy as he is holy, and to take up our cross and deny ourselves and to, to look more like Jesus. Now, within that vineyard, there is a perfect order. Nothing is out of place. Nothing is, if we are listening to the Lord, nothing is as it should not be. God in creation took chaos and made order. He never takes order and turns it into chaos. And so in each of our lives individually and in our lives as the church together, God is taking us from one level or another of chaos and transforming us into the people and the planting that he wants in his vineyard. In other words, he's ordering our lives. 
He's bringing together within us and among us his kingdom. And his kingdom is just that. It's a kingdom, not a democracy. And even though it's hard for us to swallow that living in the culture we live in, nevertheless, we have to hear that. And then finally, the vineyard of the Lord should be exactly, exactly what God tells us he wants it to be. So if you would, look with me at Isaiah chapter 5, verse uh, 1 through 7, verses 1 through 7. Uh, I forget what page number it's on in the bulletin just now. I guess it's on uh, page 4. Let's look at this for just a moment. Because this is extremely instructive. The vineyard of the Lord is, first and foremost, a place that is chosen by God. Okay? Uh, look at verse 1. Uh, verse 2, rather. No, verse 1. Uh, my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. God chose to put that vineyard in his uh, analogy give, spoken through the prophet Isaiah someplace where it's going to take root, someplace where it's going to grow. And so for each of us as, as branches on the vine in God's vineyard, he's placing us, if we're watchful, if we're alert, he's placing us where we're going to grow, where the fertileness of the soil is going to nurture our walk with the Lord. Number two, God's vineyard is a place that is lovingly prepared by him. Verse 2, look at verse 2. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. So he's prepared it for a purpose that it should yield the sweetness of holiness. Number three, it's a place where the Lord can speak to us and reason with us. Look at verses three and four. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? So this vineyard is a place where God can talk to us. He can reason with us. He can make us understand and open our eyes and our hearts, ask us questions of our lives and say, Hey, Todd, I planted you here for this purpose. Why is that not coming into being? It's not because I have intended you. Is it because you're not listening to me? Is it because you've got something else on your heart that you're putting in front of me? Why is that? And number four, it's a place where the Lord can, if necessary, warn us. Look at verses five and six. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste and it shall not be pruned or hoed. And it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. What does the Lord do to us to get our attention when we begin to walk away from him? When we begin to move out of the surroundings of his vineyard? He begins to remove his Holy Spirit from our lives. To trouble us. To take away that, that joy of our salvation so that we might be have a heightened sense that something is not right in our lives. As it is with the individual, so it is with the church. And not only with individuals, but with the church, God can withdraw his Holy Spirit and take away the blessing that he has been giving. The blessing that tells us that we are in fellowship with him. This is hard stuff. So the vineyard of the Lord, whether it's the church or individuals within the church, is intended by God 
to be his vision of heaven on earth. It's an object lesson. The vineyard of the Lord is where we learn to be what we should be. It's where we learn how things are done in heaven. It's no coincidence that the liturgy we use on Sunday morning is the liturgy that is taking place in heaven. So much of what we say during the Mass, during the Holy Eucharist, comes directly from Scripture. This is God-breathed liturgy. And so as we gather in God's vineyard, as we work in God's vineyard, he wants us to understand that this is his will. As in heaven, so on earth, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Sound familiar? So if that's the case, there seems to be a problem in God's vineyard. And that problem is sour grapes. There's nothing new under the sun. This problem of sour grapes that Jesus highlights in our gospel lesson today. This sense of, of not wanting to cooperate with the vineyard owner is something that has happened ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it's something that led, obviously, as Jesus tells us, to his crucifixion. And it's something that is going to continue to happen until he returns. The tenants in the vineyard, in the gospel lesson, they tried to steal something, to take something from the vineyard owner that if they had been seeking obedience to the will of the vineyard owner, they would have been given. But instead, they took it by force. Think about this now. If by obedience we can gain the fullness of life that God wants for us, why is it that we rebel? Why is it that we try to steal something from the vineyard instead of work with the Lord? Because that's what's going on today. That's what's happening both in the church and in the lives of so many individuals. There's a stealing going on. And just as Jesus promised, the kingdom of God can be taken away from those who try to take by force what God would give them through obedience. So how do we solve the problem of sour grapes in God's vineyard? And this is where I really want to dig in. How is it that we can answer those who are living lives that are creating sour grapes? I've been doing a lot of thinking about this lately because, well, look at the thing that we're doing. We're trying to establish a new parish. And it's not just here. We are not just here so that... The people of Bath County, Montgomery County, Menifee County, wherever they might come from, we're not here so they can have another option to worship on Sunday morning. If it were just about creating another option, well, there are plenty of churches. And, and, and that is not why we are existing. We are existing because like every other church in this community, we have a charism, a gift, a ministry that is unique to us. And that ministry just happens to be, as, as we talked about before, before service today, the gift of prayer and the desire to share. I, I know that all the churches in this town, all the churches in this county, the folks are praying. It's not that we're going to do that any differently than they do, but our emphasis needs to be on praying as a gift, praying that, that uh, as a place, creating a place where people can draw even closer to Jesus, intimacy with him. So that being the case, the vineyard, we have to recognize some things. As we tend to reach out to the communities that we're involved in, 
uh, in this gateway region area. We have to realize that there are some, some, some things to watch for and some things that we can participate in with God's will. Listen to this. Number one, we need to recognize that the vineyard of the Lord does not belong to us. Neither does it belong to those who are outside of the walls of the vineyard or those who are within it but maybe trying to be wild grapes instead of sweet grapes. So if we look at verse 33 from our gospel lesson, we're going to see something here. Look with me, if you would, at the gospel lesson on page 6. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. We don't own that vineyard. <coughs> that vineyard belongs to God. And so as we reach out to a community to try to bring them, those who are completely unchurched, especially, as we reach out to them and try to bring them into the vineyard of the Lord, number one, first and foremost, we have to remember that this is not our vineyard. It's His. We are welcoming them into something that we have to treat with reverence every day of our lives. We then have to pray. It's up to the Holy Spirit to convince and convict and draw His children home. That's what we have to be about. We have to be a people of prayer who will understand that these things are going to be wrought by prayer, not by programs. Number three, as we pray, we have to remember that, number one, the Holy Spirit will move. The Holy Spirit will draw his children home. And number two, we have to understand that people understand God's will even if they're being disobedient. Now that sounds kind of strange, but we have to trust this. Why do we have to trust this? I mean, you're maybe saying to yourself, well, Todd, how can, you, how can you say that people who are being disobedient understand what the will of the Lord is? Well, let's look at verses 40 and 41 of our gospel lesson. Now, when the, and this is Jesus speaking to the religious leaders. When, now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They, the religious leaders, said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Did you catch that? These are the religious leaders who are fighting Jesus, trying to catch him up. The same men who are going to later have him put to death. They understand intrinsically that the story Jesus is telling is a story of injustice. They understand intrinsically that what they are about to do to Jesus is wrong. And Jesus, nevertheless, tries to open their eyes to get them to see it. Those people that we meet who aren't in church, who are doing all sorts of things that we wouldn't approve of as Christians, we need to understand that deep down in their hearts they know that they're doing wrong. Paul says that the witness of God is all around us if we just open our eyes. Even those who have never heard the story of Jesus are going to be held accountable because God has revealed in his creation the truth. And so we can trust that those who are doing things that are not in concert with God's word, we can trust that deep down they know what is right and wrong. 
They were created in God's image. Now, number four, not all disobedience is born of outright rebellion. Some of it is simply misguided. Paul tells us in Philippians in verse 15 that, that there may, may be those who slightly disagree with what Paul is teaching, and Paul gently, gently reminds them that if they seek the Lord on that, they'll get it right. But they have to seek the Lord on that. Then, we also have to be willing to surrender ourselves obediently to the Lord. We cannot preach what we have not practiced. And Paul reminds us in verses 15 and 16 in the Philippians passage that we are to imitate him. And we are to look at the example that is being set so that we, so that we begin to live that example. And as we live that example, then we can set ourselves to the work of catechizing those whom the Holy Spirit sends to us, teaching them the faith. Paul says that their God is their belly and their, their destruction is their end and, and they're seeking all sorts of things that they should not seek. We can help them understand that if we are living as vines that are producing good fruit in God's kingdom. And then finally, the transformation from sour to sweet grapes will begin to happen in us, in the church and in the world, when we allow Jesus Christ to transform, as Paul says, the body of our humiliation into the glory that he has in store for us. So, fellow grapes, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of praying and a lot of elbow grease that is needed as we continue the journey of not only forming this parish, but of, of actually becoming an added voice in this community of salt and light, of, of fertile soil, of rich water, anything that will help produce good grapes in God's vineyard. I know that this has been a little dry. I know it's been a little long. But ponder it, please. Pray about it. Take these scriptures home with you this week and, and reread them from time to time. And let them speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And let him reveal to you how it is that you can become a sweeter grape and how it is that you can encourage others to do the same. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We also thank you that you have planted us in this place for your purposes, in your timing. Father, we just pray that you would use us, that you would use us to help create and beautify and enlarge the little corner of your vineyard in which you've planted us. Let it be pleasing in your sight. Let us hear you, and let us follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. invite you to turn to page 358 in your prayer books and I invite you to stand as you're able as we confess our faith this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, we lift your church before you. Let it be a vineyard that is pleasing in your sight, a reminder to you of people who are striving to hear you and live in your will. Let us, with Robert, our Archbishop, and William and Frederick, our bishops, and all your clergy and people, be filled with the sweetness of holiness. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift before you our nation and those given authority over us. Let us ever act, vote, and voice our opinions in such a way as to reflect your desire that we love you, walk humbly with you, and love those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift before you your world. As it becomes smaller, it seems we are less able to understand it. Help us to listen to those around us that we might respond joyfully to their needs and questions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift before you our local communities. It's so very easy to block out those who are more familiar to us. Yet these are the very people we might be able to most effectively touch with your love. Give, give us hearts of patience and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we bless you for the memory of those who served you in this life and now serve you in glory. May we one day stand before you with them, offering praise and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor as we take a moment of silence before the throne of grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, keep you in, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us continue worshiping this morning as we receive our tithes and offerings. Um, Miss Susie, could I prevail upon you? Thank you, ma'am. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of heaven. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. Receive, O Lord, the gifts presented by your people for the work of your church. Amen. invite you to stand as we return our thanks to the Lord, singing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and our <coughs> angels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, 
out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night in, before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Mary and Martha of Bethany, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him that takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. Beloved, the gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We'll do this a little differently this morning. If we could form maybe a, a little line up here, I'll come and serve each of you the host, and if you would hold it in your hand until I come with the chalice, 
and then you can intake, and we'll receive that way this morning. Come on ahead. the cup of salvation. Body, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Jean, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Susie, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Don, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. John, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. You may be seated.
you to stand as you're able. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.